Hello, welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana and I have a very special guest I'm so excited to chat with today and introduce you to. This is Becca Syme. How are you, Becca? I'm so good. Thank you for having me today. We are so excited. You don't know this, but Jamie and I kind of fangirl over you from time to time because I'll be like, yeah, my strengths coach Becca and Jamie's always like, tell me what Becca said. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. That's so awesome. Long-term listeners to the podcast have heard me talk about my strengths coach, business coach, success coach. You go by a lot of different coaching (laughs) titles, Mm -hmm. (laughs) everything coach, universal coach. (laughs) Yes. But um, I am so glad to have you join us. So like I said, Becca has been my business coach since like at least 2020, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. Um, We talk life, we talk business. So yeah, Becca, we talk about a little bit of everything. Technically, you're my business coach, so I get to write off our our calls yes. as far as the IRS is concerned. But we talk a lot about um, biology, physiology, all kinds of stuff. Not a not a therapist, but I am right. so so thankful for all of your insights. And this is our very first. We're we're in the three hundreds at Praying Christian Women. This is our first time we have a show, as far as I remember, dedicated to menopause. So where I want to start is why, why do you think that is? Because like, I'm not menopausal yet, but I'm in my early forties. And so I know it's coming. And basically all I know, all I've been told is, oh, honey, it's going to be terrible. And like, literally that is all I've ever heard from the older women in my church, in my life. Why do you think that is? I mean, I have some thoughts about it. I think some of it is grief related too, right? For an awful mm-hmm. lot of people, right? Like it really mm-hmm. signals a change in your life. And um, and not everybody's always as excited about that as I think. Like I, because I, um, and I've shared this with you before, I think, but I had a hysterectomy in my 30s. And mm-hmm. so I went through the whole like grief about the change in my fertility and stuff like that mm-hmm. a long time ago. Um, almost 10 years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. And so from my perspective, um, that was really separate from the experience with my health. And so I didn't have a lot of the emotions to kind of sort through when I was dealing with the premenopause stuff. Mm -hmm. So when I started having this happen, I was so curious the way you're curious about medical things, right? I wasn't Mm -hmm. really having any emotional experience about it at all. And I was just like, why are these things happening to me? What's going on? And every single doctor I would go to, they had, they were like, I don't know. Like it, they, I don't know. I don't know. Uh-huh. And, and I literally had a friend one day when we were talking about it and I mentioned that I've been having these headaches and she was like, she knew that I had had ear issues before about like getting ear infections because I had really itchy ears And then she asked me, like, are you doing this and this as well? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, oh, you know, those are all perimenopause symptoms or like premenopause symptoms. I was like, what? No. I've never heard of itchy ears as being a a thing to look out for. (laughs) So I got a little obsessed about like trying to figure out what was going on. And, And honestly, because I had, so I had COVID in 2020 and I was 40, 41, I think when I had it. So like I, I had a really immediate, very um, serious brain fog Mm -hmm. difference that happened in me in 2020. And so I assumed that a ton of it was related to the long COVID. And when I met with my doctor and she was like, you're having all these other symptoms, et cetera. And I was like, oh, and then I've had long COVID. And she's like, well, did you have, and then she listed off all these. And I'm like, no, I didn't have Mm -hmm. any of those symptoms. I just had the like brain fog. And she's like, well, that might also be menopause or perimenopause and not, Mm -hmm. you know, a COVID thing. And she's like, you know, you'll never know. But um, so it kind of made me experiment with like, what could I change? What could I do differently? Can I make this better if I, you know, address certain things? And um, so I I always assume that a lot of the reasons that we don't talk about it is that the symptoms are not as big when they first start. They seem to be really small. And because a lot of us in our late 30s, early 40s and mid 40s are so busy, it's not like we're hitting a time in our life where we have a ton of free time. So it also happens to coincide with like very small symptoms, very little amount of time. And then we all just kind of know like this thing is coming for me at some point. So we may not make it to the doctor to talk about it. And then you add on to that that most medical professionals 
don't talk about it. They're not Mm -hmm. well-versed in what it looks like. And you could even go to multiple different doctors and have them listen to all of your symptoms and basically say, well, who knows what it could be right? and then not do anything about it. And, and so you may not even get attention from medical professionals about it, let alone from other women. Yeah. I've been doing a tiny bit. My eyes have been a little open to how dismissive doctors can be towards women and it just turned into, oh, maybe you need to lose weight or, oh, maybe it's hormones. And then it just ends there. And, and so it really does feel like all of us are kind of alone (laughs) in this process. Um, So that's why you and I, like, we just started talking about it on our last coach call. I'm like, please come on the show. And then I told Jamie, you were going to be on here. He's like, can I like give you a list of questions to ask? (laughs) I don't have the list of questions, but I just, I appreciate having someone who's willing to talk about it, but also who isn't just there to like make you feel terrified, right? Like, do you, I'll tell you a story from my baby shower. My baby shower was me and Scott's pastor's wife. Cause I moved just a few weeks before the wedding. So I didn't have my own social circle there. And then a bunch of middle-aged women from a women's Bible study that I didn't know. So my baby shower was some really sweet, nice gifts and some cupcakes and a whole lot of, oh, honey, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> Pastor's wife like apologized to me at the end, you know, because like the, the t- she started by saying like, what kind of advice would you give Alana as a newlywed? And it was things like, well, if he snores too bad, just, you know, punch him in the gut and that'll usually stop. <laughs> you know, like it was, it was all of this kind of stuff. And I feel like that's if, if menopause is talked about, it's talked about in this like big, terrible, horrible thing that's going to happen to you. And like, I've even been told, yeah, you might go crazy. And, and then they leave it at that. I'm like, okay, tell me a little bit more, please. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the, the level of self-awareness that I think like our generation. So I would say like the, probably the younger Gen X generation, the older millennials and then mid mid millennials, we're so much more self-aware than Mm -hmm. I think people were before us in terms Mm -hmm. of like, I have more knowledge about what goes on in my body than I used to. Mm -hmm. I have more Mm -hmm. consciousness about kind of the global scale of health than I used to. So it isn't just like, we're more conscious. It, it, it is also, I think we have more information in a way that not everyone used to have access to. It used to really be like, you had to almost have a specialty because of course, like before the mm-hmm. internet, if you wanted to learn about some of this stuff, you either had to know a doctor or go mm-hmm. to a medical library or have encyclopedias right. or like you had yeah. to have some kind of special access. And now, like, I mean, I know medical professionals and talk to them regularly. I'm not a doctor. I know Alana said this, but I want to also say, like, I'm not a doctor. Primarily, the way that I come at this is I coach a lot of middle-aged writers. Mm -hmm. And I've coached more than 6,000 individual writers. But I coach a lot of middle-aged writers who are all going through this Mm -hmm. at sort of similar times. So, like, when I first started to see people start to go through it, And I realized, oh, this is going to be like an epidemic of ours. Like we all need to be talking about this biological stuff because so often when we address like, why am I not feeling good or like what's wrong? Why am I not feeling successful? We don't always go to like, have you been in the sun, Carol? Like, are you (laughs) taking your vitamins? Do you drink enough water? Like we're so often trying to do something in our business or marriage or relationships to try to make ourselves feel better. And often the feeling better is at our fingertips. Like we could Mm -hmm. feel better if we focus on certain things about our health. Um, And, and so part of my job as a coach is to try to bring awareness to people of like, have you talked to your doctor about the menopause symptoms you're having or the perimenopause Mm -hmm. symptoms you're having? Right. So yeah, um, but yeah, I, it's it's complicated. Well, for people like me who turned forty and were never even given a list of symptoms, like a year ago when I turned forty, if you had asked me what are the symptoms of menopause, I would have said, um, you get hot flashes, hot flashes. and your libido, I'm sure, decreases, and maybe yeah. you're moody. Like, and and that's <laughs> literally <laughs> the extent of what I knew. So, like, you're talking about itchy ears and stuff. So, for people like me, and and I would encourage you if if you've gotten this far in the episode, and like maybe you're in your twenties, and like, oh, this totally doesn't pertain to me. It will, and I feel like knowing 
what's going on in our bodies and knowing what our bodies will do. I think that there's so much empowerment that comes. Like I remember it was our, um, it was either my second or third pregnancy. Our first pregnancy was a miscarriage. And I, so I think it was my third pregnancy when I finally realized I am depressed and a terror, like I feel like a terrible person because I have these changes happening in my body. It is not because I'm the biggest sinner in the world. And that was so freeing to understand like, yeah. oh, this is coming from like, basically like it's coming from me, but it's not coming, like it's coming from my body. It's not like ingrained yeah. in my soul. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I didn't not do something the worst person. to make this happen. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sinning being punished because either. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So I would say, yeah, even if this feels like decades away for you, I feel like, yeah, this is a case where knowledge absolutely is power. So could you give me a list of just the, um, like, give me a list of the common symptoms, like the hot flashes that people talk about, but also give me the list of the funny things like itchy ears that like a lot of people are probably never going to put together and be like, oh, maybe this is perimenopause. Yeah. Itchy skin in general. Anytime somebody tells me that like you're having itchy skin, I'm like, okay, have you had either your hormones or, and vitamins? Cause that's another thing that mm. can be like vitamins and minerals, um, balances checked. Um, headaches are a big one that, and for me, it was pretty persistent, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was having pretty persistent headaches and I tried the elimination of other things to see if it would mm -hmm. fix the problem. And it just didn't, um, the, the, um, sleep changes and temperature changes are one that we talk about a lot. Um, weight gain and weight loss, which is so weird. This is one mm -hmm. of the pieces about menopause that I think is so interesting is, you'll talk to one person and listen to their list of symptoms and someone else will say, Oh, I, I had this, this, and this, like if you had mm -hmm. a set of 20 symptoms, somebody's right. going to check off four of them and somebody else is going to check off four of them and somebody else is going to check off four. So right. I kind of feel like s similar to how we approach productivity, right? I feel like there is a, like vision changes can be one of them. And, and a lot of people don't notice the, mood changes other than all of a sudden we realize we just don't care about certain things. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will attribute that to like age. Oh, I'm just getting older. So now I know. And I'm like, no, actually that's your, your estrogen levels changing. Like, or it, not that it has to be right, but that it, that's one of the reasons that when a lot of people hit 40, they really do kind of go over the hill of like, okay, I don't care about certain things anymore. And it's because, and again, like, biologically, I'm not a doctor, but this is what I read, right? That there is a biological need to attract mating right. that causes an awful lot of the way that we think about ourselves. It causes a lot of the internal patterns that we have. And when your biological need to attract mating changes yeah. it, for, for everyone, right? Not just for mm -hmm. people who are biological women, but for everyone, then it makes your body change. It makes your mind change. It makes everything about you change. And some people will get, they'll have that ticking clock experience, right? Where their right. libido actually increases and their mm -hmm. desire for sex increases. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden it decreases or changes. So like it gives anytime, a Hail Mary. <laughs> yeah. Like, yes, that's what it feels like to me. Like uh -huh. I remember that, but it, it's, it's fascinating to me that it sounds so scary when, when people talk about it, really probably the only scary thing that happened was the extreme mood change days, right? Where yeah. like, but, but again, if you have been having a period your whole life, then mm -hmm. you understand what it feels like to have these out of control mood shifts. And then all of a sudden be like, wait, what day is it? And exactly. oh, that's right. <laughs> now I know why I feel this way. Um, so I, I assumed that it was still, cause I still had my ovaries or I still have them. Mm -hmm. So I assumed it was just like time of the month stuff, but it would be so right. extreme because even mm -hmm. the hot flashes weren't that bad. And, and again, uh -huh. everybody's different, but, right. um, but the, the mood change was so extreme for me. It would be like the, the most intense crying, you know, just mm -hmm. like I, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't explain it. And I, had a conversation with the person I was dating at the time where I was like, look, I don't sound rational. And, and this is different from my normal, like when I would have mood, mood shifts. Yeah. I don't sound rational. You're not going to be able to comfort me. I will not be able right. to feel better. So like, mm -hmm. it's probably better because we weren't, we, we don't live together. 
it was probably mm-hmm. better that we would just not be around each other when I would feel like that because yeah. he would feel so helpless and I mm-hmm. would feel frustrated and helpless. And right. so it was a lot easier, but, but that was the only thing where I was like, oh, I would have, if I didn't already know I was in perimenopause, I would have gone to the doctor mm-hmm. about that. Cause mm-hmm. it was such a significant change, but everything else feels like such a tiny, like my appetite changed a little bit. My hair started mm-hmm. falling out like little things like that, that you just yeah. will attribute to like, oh, this has just a little a weird thing. Bit different yeah. than yesterday. Right. It doesn't feel like anything's wrong, but it's like, but the collection of them all together is like, no, your body is shifting into a new form of itself. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're uh, metamorphing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like a butterfly. So, um, at what point would you encourage somebody if they're talking to you about stuff and like, there definitely is a sense of, yep, that's, that's menopause or that's perimenopause, that's normal. At what point do you say, yeah, maybe you should talk to a doctor about this? Like, do you go to a doctor with every new symptom or when do you know, okay, this is maybe a little more extreme and maybe you should talk to somebody? Yeah, this is hard for me because, and you know this, we did this even in coaching, right? Like every mm-hmm. time something would change, yep. I would always be like, is it bio? Like, are yep. you checking? How are you like, sleeping? Have you, yeah, how <laughs> are you sleeping? Have you had your, your vitamins and minerals checked? Like, yeah. have you had a blood test done? Because I do think there also are just, again, because this has happened a lot to me lately as well. Like I have a lot of friends with our, we're all in our forties and they're getting cancer, And I'm like, anytime you start having symptoms, I want you to at least talk to a medical professional about it, where it's Mm -hmm. not like, I don't talk to them about every headache, but if Mm -hmm. I get headaches more than three times in a week Mm -hmm. and it's not attributed to like, I had a sinus headache or something like that, I'm going to be like, yeah, maybe you should talk to a doctor about that. And, and and I want to caveat this really quickly because I, I have a healthy respect for medical information in terms of like, I, I, I go to my doctor, I guess, if that makes sense. Like I go for regular checkups, I get my blood tested regularly, yeah. et cetera. So um, not everybody equally trusts the medical professionals. And so I want to say, right. if you don't find, find someone naturopath, mm-hmm. I don't care who it is, somebody yeah. that you're talking to who can give you some perspective about it. Cause I think the danger zone in just being like, well, I'll take my chances is right. that with some of this stuff, like I changed a lot about my experience with my symptoms when I started modifying my diet and it changed a ton. Like it, it really, really helped to do some diet modification and it was worth it to me because the symptoms were frustrating enough that I just didn't want to mm-hmm. have them anymore. Um, and it changed my brain fog. It changed my headaches. It changed my, like it just changed so much. Um, but I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't been chatting with my doctor about like, what are the, what are the things I could do that don't include HRT? Cause I wasn't there yet. Like I wasn't, Mm -hmm. you know, in that space. Um, and, but I feel like when I coach people, I'm constantly, if I've heard more than one month in a row that they're like getting headaches or they have brain Mm -hmm. fog, I'm like, go to get a blood test, like see what's going on. Because if it's something that's serious, the earlier you catch it, the more likely you are to be safe in terms of like to be able to handle it well and effectively. And it's always the stuff that we leave and don't address. And then Mm -hmm. it sort of comes for us, right? Like that's the stuff that is the the worrisome thing for me. So I want people to get on it as early as possible. That makes sense. And then can you talk to us a little bit? I bet you'd be a great person for giving just some encouragement and advice. How do you know if you're with the wrong doctor who is being kind of dismissive and things like that? And then what do you do if you're, I love what you said about like you turn 40 and your people pleasing gene just like stops functioning. <laughs> yes, it does. I kind of like that. It it feels a lot better than it did, but it's so great. it still is hard to be like, okay, mm-hmm. you're, you, it's hard to advocate for yourself as a woman with, um, you know, experts. So can you talk to us a little bit about that and just give some tips and advice? Yeah, there's a, um, there's a tip that one of my friends gave me, who's a medical expert that I said, I really like this. And it Mm -hmm. is, can you give me the differential diagnosis on that? Like, can you, like, if, if you're assuming, let's say you go into the doctor and it's, um, uh, and I'm overweight, 
So like my doctors were constantly asking me like, how's the weight loss going? Or like, what are Mm -hmm. you doing to address the weight and things like that? And I get that, that can be a contributing factor. But Mm -hmm. if you, if you understand the biology of our, like how our bodies actually work, weight is not a cause of those things, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, Mm -hmm. it's a contributing factor. They can't nail down that any one thing causes any. So I'm like, okay, if it's not the weight though, what do you think it could be besides that? Like, have you done Mm -hmm. the differential diagnosis? And most doctors don't do that with every patient just because it's not necessary. It's like, if somebody comes in with a runny nose and a Mm -hmm. fever, you don't need to give them all the possible things that it could be. You just assume well, let's just give you some antibiotics and see if we can clear mm-hmm. it up. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always want to know, Hey, do you mind giving me the differential diagnosis about that? Just like, is there anything else that it could possibly be that you're ruling out for some mm-hmm. reason that is like, so one of my friends is a, a surgeon's wife and mm-hmm. she she said this i'll never forget this after i had surgery she was like in in the medical profession everybody thinks they have a zebra when they're really a horse and she's huh. like the in terms of like i think that i have this really rare like right. exotic thing that no mm-hmm. one has when right. the reality is you have a cold it's going to be fine. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. and, or Mm -hmm. or it's just a pain that no one can explain it or whatever. Right. Um, so don't go looking for zebras. That's my Mm -hmm. thing is like, I don't Mm -hmm. want us to assume that just because we have symptoms that align with WebMD, that somehow we have everything in the world, but also don't assume that the doctor is correct when they're telling you like, you're going to be fine. I would, I would always ask for a differential Mm -hmm. diagnosis and just say, And you can do it really kindly. You can just say, hey, would you mind? Like, is it okay if you just give me the differential diagnosis about that? I would like Mm -hmm. to know if there's anything else that it might be just so I can rule out. Like, should I be on the lookout for other symptoms? Is there something Mm -hmm. worrisome that might develop from this, et cetera? Um, But the other piece too, just in talking about advocating for yourself in the medical profession is know that the reason most doctors do not address things like this when they don't is not that they're mean or bad or wrong. It literally is. They are busy. They're overworked. They're exhausted. And most of them just don't have the brain space to be Mm -hmm. able to do this kind of in-depth work with patients when they're basically expected to turn somebody over every 15 minutes. Right. So an awful lot of the reason that we don't get the medical care we need is because the system itself is overtaxed. And, and because medical care is so expensive, not everyone can afford to go to a specialist who has a whole hour to just talk to you Mm -hmm. about what's going on. But if you do have the financial ability to do that, I recommend seeing specialists whenever you can, because you're more likely to get someone who's seen very specifically what you're looking for. So that's my, my one piece. Um, But in terms of the the other piece of the question you asked, which was like, how do you decide whether or Mm -hmm. not you're with the right person? Do you feel heard and understood? That's, that's the main question that I have. Mm -hmm. Because if you go in there and every time you go in, they are shaming you about something or they just automatically go to like, you know, do you need to lose weight? And I'd be Mm -hmm. like, right. But is there anything else that it could be please? Right. Like Mm -hmm. just tell me what the options are. Because yeah. I don't, I don't assume, make any assumptions. And, and when I coach people, it's like, I don't make any assumptions about you. I don't mm-hmm. assume that, you know, because you're this, then that means that it's like, no, we want to get all the way down to the individualized truth. And yeah. it does take some advocacy, but I will say, if you're a person who struggles to advocate for yourself, take someone with you who will advocate in the room with you, mm-hmm. if you can. And if you can't do that, uh, like if if that just feels uncomfortable and the differential diagnosis question doesn't work, then I would see if you can find another doctor. And Mm -hmm. and I understand it's not possible for everybody in their rural spaces and not, you know, like I get that. Um, But if you have all of that, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, are you, yeah. Insurance and everything. Yeah. So I get that, but I would definitely use the differential diagnosis thing just to see if that will help kind of shift them into like, oh, this person, 
might be a little smarter than I thought they were. So maybe I need to pay attention mm-hmm. and give them my full face, which is, you know, what we're right. for. But it's yeah. hard on them too. Like they're very, very tired and taxed. And the pandemic was really hard on the medical profession. And, Mm -hmm. and sometimes I feel like I'm not trying to excuse anybody's behavior. It's awful when we get ignored in medical situations and it can sometimes lead to complications that end our lives. So I understand the stakes and also they are trying their best often. Um, and so I, I get not wanting to pipe up and be like, you know, Mm-hmm. take care of me when it, when right. you can sense most of us that like they're, they're tired too. Yeah, no, I love that. And it's a great reminder to just be keeping everybody in the medical profession in our prayers. Like, you know, you yep. go, you go to a prayer meeting and it's like 90% of people who have prayer requests, it's for health concerns, right? Mm-hmm. Like my, my uncle's got a, you know, a tumor and, and all of this, but you know, and all of that, it's a great reminder. Okay. Be praying for the doctors who are taking care of this person too, or the nurses who are stressed and overworked or the specialists yeah. who are nervous to make a wrong diagnosis because like you said, a life can be at stake there. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. And yeah. even just praying for the people before you go in, like mm-hmm. pray for your doctors. If you have a doctor that you see consistently, you should be praying for them. And I don't mean that yeah. like, you know, shame on you if you're not, I more mean yeah. if you haven't thought about that mm-hmm. as part of your agency in your medical care. And, and yeah, beyond the supernatural pieces that, you know, not everybody believes that supernatural things happen when you pray. So let's just talk Mm -hmm. about the natural things that happen when you pray. When you orient yourself in a service methodology towards a person, like I'm Mm going to see Alana in a half an hour. And so Mm -hmm. I'm praying for her and thinking like the best possible things that I can and my my hope mm-hmm. that she's okay and doing well and that this yeah. hour is going to go well. That changes how I also show up in the room when I walk Absolutely. in. Mm-hmm. So it, yes, it's about them and it's about the supernatural and yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Like I do, I do believe that all that happens. And also prayer should make us take action differently in the world. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when we pray for our doctors, when we pray for the people who are serving us, it makes us fully aware and attentive. Because for many of us, there are things we need to do to address our health concerns that we don't want to do. It's very, very painful to have to go to 15 medical appointments in three months because you got to fix something that you Mm -hmm. let go for a long time. And so I think some of our fear and frustration and animosity about talking about medical stuff is also like we're conscious that we aren't always the best stewards of our physical bodies either. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that can become a big deal, right? So sometimes just that awakeness, which is the goal, I think, yeah. of being in God's presence is mm-hmm. th- that you become awake to all of the ways in which you are participating. Like my mm-hmm. my pastor has this phrase that I love, which is that your say so matters. So like Mm -hmm. when you say amen to something or you agree with something like your say so matters. And so when when you show up in the room, how you present, how you are present, that matters Mm -hmm. too. how you participate with your physical body's health, how you participate with your mental health, that all matters in, in ways that I think we don't take into account sometimes because we focus so much on what the supernatural piece does right? And Mm -hmm. it's like, but the natural Mm -hmm. piece is sometimes more important to how we show up in the space. Yeah. I remember a testimony of someone and it was, I I read this book and I forget which book it was in, but I was, this was decades ago. And it was the first time that it really drove home the power of what you give your amen to. And the example was a woman wanted some family counseling. And so her doctor diagnosed her like checked the box it says she has anxiety so that insurance would cover this counseling and for the next few weeks she had to like she was wondering why am I feeling this way and and I don't think that everybody is as susceptible to this but in her case it was okay she verbally agreed sure go ahead and tell my insurance company I have anxiety and and somehow but you know that was in a way like giving her amen to that and boom now she's got all of these these symptoms and so I know sometimes I don't even want to hear like 
possible side effects because then my body like takes that as its to-do list you know I mean it it, it does a little bit and that uh may -huh. be partly why we don't talk about it is that it is mm. so different for everyone and there is right. an element of like if you hear someone talking about something you're more likely to look for it right like yes. you're more likely uh -huh. to notice it and then mm -hmm. you know so so I do think there's a consciousness danger as well of like being yeah. overconscious. So I wouldn't go looking for mm -hmm. any of this stuff. But if you notice mm -hmm. it or notice it in other people, I would always yeah. be aware of like, sometimes the little things really need us to address them so that they don't become big things. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to something you said at the very beginning about mm -hmm. just the, the sense of mourning that comes with biological aging and regardless of what your hormones are doing. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I mean, even somebody who, you know, like has very different hormones or maybe, you know, has never had the the same type of hormonal flow. Um, there's still a lot of things that change as you get older. And I know I had, um, just a, a very, like, it's one of those poignant, I'm going to remember this forever. I played my violin in church for special music a few weeks ago and my carpal tunnel got so bad. Like I was in a lot of pain afterwards and I went into the pastor's office and just started crying. Like, you know, I was alone in there and I was just like, this hurts. And I wasn't crying because it hurt. I was crying because I hate the fact that my body doesn't do the stuff that it used to do without even thinking about it. Yep. Yeah. And so, I don't think yeah. we acknowledge that often enough. And there's something mm -hmm. called the emotion cycle where like, there's a dependency set in emotions. And if you can't see my hands, I'm pointing to four different places along a line, right? Where okay. it's like, we start off in one place and the goal is to get to this other place that's four steps down the road. But both a negative and positive mm -hmm. emotions have a dependency in them. And when we start off in one, in order to get to a place where we completely clear the situation and we understand like either I'm going to be okay, or this is what my part is to do about this. It, we have to go through all of these feelings. And when we mm -hmm. don't feel them fully and finish feeling them and get all the way to the, what can I do about this? We can get stuck in that space. And I see mm -hmm. so many people who, as they age, get stuck in the anger space or the sadness space or the fear space. And they don't get into like, well, what can I do about this? Cause the bottom line is, and this is the frustrating part. I can't change the fact that I'm aging. Like mm -hmm. I can't change the fact yeah. that my body is going to, you know, conk out on me basically at some mm -hmm. point, right? Like that's mm -hmm. not something I have control over, but I do have control over how I think about that process in terms right. of like, I, I can be grateful for what I have had and I can try to maintain every semblance and shred of physical health that I still have. And many of us mm -hmm. need that wake up call in our late thirties and early forties. I have a friend who's a physical therapist and, and he mm -hmm. told me one time he's like, cause when I turned 35, he was like, you better start lifting weights and working out. And I was like, mm -hmm. dude, I am not tired. Like I'm okay. You're, I'm fine. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. um, and he was like, no, 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 it's not about weight loss. It's not about physical health. It's literally mm -hmm. that when your body starts to deteriorate, which is what happens after you hit 35, mm -hmm. you lose muscle mass at a rate where if you don't try to retain it intentionally, like if you don't mm -hmm. teach your body, I'm actively working, please don't lose my muscle mass. Right. Your mm -hmm. body's just going to start losing muscle mass because that's what it does when it deteriorates. Mm -hmm. So understanding mm -hmm. that like I have a physical part that I should be playing in the aging of my body if I want. And this isn't a Lana. This is literally for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, I need to do something either about my physical health or about my stamina whenever I can, like anything that I'm capable of doing. And then when I hit the end of my capability, like I can't change the fact that I have carpal tunnel, but I can manage it. Right. And so mm -hmm. if I have managed it, I want to feel all of those feelings, anger, mm -hmm. sadness, fear, guilt. The guilt is what can I do about this? And if mm -hmm. the only thing I can do is Ray to release the unrealistic expectation, right? Yeah. Like just acknowledge that it's unrealistic to expect I'm going to be young for forever. It's unrealistic mm -hmm. to expect that um, like I'm a singer. I know I'm not going to be able to sing the mm -hmm. way that I sing now for the rest of my life. 
it's right. unrealistic to expect I will have that for forever. And also mm -hmm. I'm still very grateful that I had it or have it now yeah. while I have it. And then when I know I'm going to start losing it, I want to find ways to be able to still stay connected with some sense of purpose and some sense of joy mm -hmm. and not lose this, um, ability to enjoy the work that I do or the work that I have done or the gift mm -hmm. that I've been given because I know that I know this is coming. Right. So I want right. to get myself in the mindset that I do need to feel all of these feelings about this thing. Mm -hmm. Me not feeling the feelings won't stop the aging from happening. Right. I need to have all of that grief and then get to the other side of that. So I know what my part is. What can I do to make this better? Yeah. And sometimes that's hard because sometimes you have to ask yourself, okay, am I accepting this that I shouldn't have, you know, maybe I shouldn't have to live with this pain in my back, but maybe I've just told myself, oh, this is what happens when you get older. Right. Yep. And so how do you know, it's almost like the serendipity prayer, right? Like, how mm -hmm. do you know what things you can change and, and what is truly a natural and irreversible part of aging, but how do you know when mm -hmm. you're being too passive about that and just accepting symptoms that, oh, if I had been taking this supplement, maybe I wouldn't have this thing at all. Or, you know, hey, if I switch mattresses, my back doesn't hurt ever. Yeah, for me, it feels like there's usually a personality pattern there. And this is kind of where I get into, you know, both strengths and other things, right, that help mm -hmm. us understand the ways that those neural nets fire in our brains. Mm -hmm. But there, it's often a person who will constantly not meet their own needs, just always be not needing yeah. them, meeting their own needs. They will consistently be the people who will be more passive as they start to age in just like not taking care of their bodies and not being mm -hmm. as conscious about their health and things like that. But it's because they have been forming this either formed in them or being forming this personality that over time is making them be more conscious of what other people need in themselves. So I would say if you are that kind of person, you need to know that aging is coming for you in the sense of like, it is important to put on your oxygen mask when you start to mm -hmm. pass the age of 35. And I, and again, I don't say this to guilt trip anybody. Yeah. I say it because that, that pang of guilt that we have when we get an awareness moment of like, oh my gosh, I haven't been taking care of my physical body. Like what I've been given this amazing gift in this physical body that carries me around and does things for me and helps me interact in the world. And I've been asleep to it. I just haven't mm -hmm. been paying attention to it. It's like, okay, let's wake ourselves up a little bit and take some active participation in caring for this. And then for some of us, we have a physical body that doesn't that already doesn't do what we want. You know what I mean? That like we've been dealing mm. with maybe illness or chronic illness or um, some kind of diminished capacity for a long time. And we have learned how to deal with that and or learned how to get the best out of our lives, no matter what happens in our physical body. So there is also mm. this element of not everything in life is about our physical health and about our physical body, but people who tend to go to the extreme on the other side, right? they tend to be the people who are going to the extreme about everything. So if they're the person who's like every single thing, I go and talk to my doctor about every single thing. It's mm. like, you're probably okay. You've right. probably done the work right. that you need to do. Most of this, like let's have some awareness and discussions about this is usually for people who are just not as good at meeting their own yeah. needs and sometimes have to be convinced by kind of an extreme situation Mm -hmm. That like you, you may want to pay attention to this. There are things we can do to make your life a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a great reminder because I think there's so many Christian women we're we're so used to um, sacrificing everything, right? I'm going to make all the dentist appointments for my kids and I'm going to have a cavity for 10 years that I'm never going <laughs> to bother yep. addressing. And that feels, I, that feels laudable. That feels like, oh, look at me. I'm, I'm so godly. I'm so, um, I'm, I'm, pri I've got my priorities in the right spot. And yeah. And, and that is said, I remember my doctor in, was telling me last year I turned 40. I was like, okay, time for a mammogram. And, and she was yep. going on about like, I have zero risk factors and she's, um, she's a great doctor. And so basically like she did leave it up to me. She's like, I think you should do this, but you know, 
you don't have this factor, this factor, this factor, and it's totally up to you if you want us to call and send the referral. And I've got a little bit, um, there are certain medical procedures. I get a little more anxious about some stuff than others, and I don't like people poking and prodding. So there was part of me that was like, oh, well, she's not like telling me I, I have to, so maybe I'm just going to skip it. And what it ended up doing for me is I I kind of looked at women as a collective. <laughs> I was like, you know what? If every single woman who was 40 took this test, there would be more strong, healthy women in the world. Yep. So I had her send the referral and I got my mammogram and <laughs> like I even bruised. So like I, I was like, OK, I, I wasn't being a baby about like how uncomfortable this was be. But I decided so instead of me looking at it is, oh, I'm so selfish. And like, you know, we live three hours from a medical. like it was a it was a whole ordeal to get this thing done. Um. There's part of me that could have been like, why are you being so selfish, taking an entire day away from your family, an entire day away from work for this test? It's probably going to come back negative, which it did. And so instead of looking at it like that, I looked at, you know what? The world needs more healthy women. And so I am going to, <laughs> I'm going to be a statistic here and I'm going to be one of the women who gets um, gets this test done so that women in general can be healthier and live longer and, and take care of themselves more. Yeah. And it is a, it is a vibe, right? Like it is a vibe among people, especially in, I feel like certain ages, right? Like uh, the people who are turning 40, 10 years ago had a different experience than the people mm. who are turning 40, you know, now post COVID mm -hmm. and things like that. I, I do feel like there's this element of like, we should be participating in some of these things that are yeah. the, the kind of larger, more important patterns mm -hmm. in our, uh, in our life. And, and even just things like, you know, my mom does a lot of work. It, it's interesting. My sister is a gerontologist. And so oh, like okay. my, my sister works with uh, aging populations with older adults. And then my mom, it does theology work with older mm -hmm. adults, but it's specific. They're very different, right? Like my sister yeah. is trying to kind of work in medical fields and mm -hmm. help people have the rights that they need in elder care yeah. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. My mom and, and care for their brains. My mom is trying to help women as they age do the best that they can do with the, with the years that they have. So mm -hmm. rather, and this is part of what I mean by like, I think there's some mindset changing that can happen. And as we age, not looking at it as my life is over and things, it's right. like some of us have as much life left or more yep. than the mm -hmm. life that we've already lived. Do you mean to tell me that you believe that my life as I know it is now over because I can't have X, Y, and Z? It's like, okay, that oh. feels like a heart posture that mm -hmm. needs to have some inspiration or some ministry yeah. applied to it. And, and what I love about the women finishing well thing that my mom did, I don't think they're actively making podcast episodes anymore, but the, all the ones that they've already done exist uh -huh. is that her personality. She's a very, like, I want to cross the finish line at full speed. Right. So her, her thing about finishing well is like, I want my last years to be more influential than my first years were. And it has this really kind of inspiring message to it of like, yeah. look, the the impact that you make for the faith, if you have like, you know, um, if you're a pastor, if you have young children or something that like, there's a lot that you can do teaching and, and serving mm -hmm. and doing all these things, leading words. I used to be a worship pastor, right? So it's like, you can mm -hmm. do a lot of things and a lot of positional stuff, but the yeah. most influential stuff that you do ever is going to be your personal experience with other people and the way mm -hmm. that you show up and impact and influence individual people in your lifetime, which often is yeah. our families. It often is mm -hmm. our volunteer work, our jobs. And, mm -hmm. and just to have this mentality of like, if we think we've somehow already crossed the finish line at 40 yeah. and now we're just waiting to go to heaven, it's like, that's not right. the mentality that we need to have around here. And I, I like this kind of calling of like every single minute that we live should have some kind of purpose and desire, even if your purpose honestly is to rest and, yes. and be, you know, like present, it's like, okay, great. That's your purpose. Then like do that fully to its extent. You still need yeah. to be physically in your most peak condition to make sure you have as many years as you can. But to me, it's this difference between like, when I grieve something, because I don't think there's anything ahead of me 
versus when mm-hmm. I grieve something, knowing that there's another phase that I'm going to, like, what might right. I be able to do in this next phase of life when I am not of childbearing age, when I am not, mm-hmm. you know, worried about how pretty I look anymore, when I'm not mm-hmm. like those types yeah. of things as they change, it's like, we don't talk about them because they're uncomfortable, but we should probably still be talking about them and we should probably still be well, for sure, praying about them, but we should probably mm. be at least aware. Yeah, no, I love that. I think that's a great positive note to end on. Um, how about why don't you give us um, a couple, like, give us your top two or three things that you think are amazing about being a woman who is aging? Like, what are you excited about for when you go into your 50s and 60s and 70s? It's so funny because I just think, I think it's going to just keep getting better and better, Uh right? Like every time I think, okay, the best is now behind me. And all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute. Like the thing about not caring what people think about you has been the world's biggest gift. And I just had no idea how much that would change. But what I really love about when when I watch my mom, who's she's in her seventies and Uh I watch her getting to see seven decades worth of influence on the planet, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like getting to see some of the people that she's known for 60 years and knowing the impact that she's had on them. And, you know, my, I'm 45, my sister's 43. um, So she's been a parent for 45 Mm -hmm. years and for 43 years. And she gets to see all of these influences that she's had and all of the good that happens because we're in the world and what we're doing. And, and and I know that makes her really happy. So like, I know, I see all of these things that are possible and the work that I'm doing right now, I feel like, I feel like I really came into my own in my forties. Like I finally mm-hmm. kind of found my, my, my spot and understood my, what I'm here to do in my platform. Yeah. And I feel like my best years are in front of me by a mile, like by, <laughs> by so much uh-huh. of a long shot that yeah. like, I can't even when I think about what the next 20 years are going to be like, I'm almost like it cannot come fast enough because uh-huh. I just think it's going to be so much more amazing. In the f- and yes, my back hurts. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> like I, uh-huh. <laughs> I have to work so much harder just to have yeah. the physical stamina to walk upstairs. Right. In, in just like to a kind of maintain. Way. Yeah. Yep, no, just I to maintain. It. So I'm mm-hmm. fully aware that it's going to cost me more of my time and effort. to do that. But I want what I want so much. And I think if I could give anyone listening the, the gift of like knowing what it is that you want to see happen in your fifties or sixties or Mm seventies or eighties or nineties, knowing what you can still bring to the world, what import you still have, what value you still carry. um, That's what I think is making me look forward to the future is like, I know there's still so much left to experience and do and be and think and understand and people to meet. It's like, I'm never going to run out of things that I want to do in this life. And in the next, there's just never going to, it's never going to end. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. And it, it kind of gave me a sad realization when you were talking, because, you know, I love that Christian women are so it as a generality, like so invested in their families, and so committed to giving so much to their children or their nephews or their nieces, or, you know, the children in their church. But if we do make that the only goal of a woman, then yeah, she hits 40 and it's like, okay, now what? Okay. Bring on the grandkids. Cause that's all I'm, <laughs> all I'm good for, you know? And so I love your reminder that there is so much more. Um, we're not just the wombs of the world, <laughs> yeah. you know? And um, I think that's, that's beautiful. And I love your message of, yeah, the best is, is always yet to come. Cause we've got heaven yep. ahead of us. So no matter what happens between there and 100%. now, <laughs> Yep. I love you talking about your mom. It reminds me of my grandma. Um, we've talked about her several times on the show before. Just amazing prayer warrior, really quirky woman. She would go, she still did mission trips to China in her like late 70s, early 80s. She'd carry like a hundred Bibles in this big oversized dress and <laughs> smuggle Bibles in. And so, you know, I love that um it sounds like you and I both have pictures of women who aged beautifully and yes. with enthusiasm. And I hope that yeah you and I become those pictures for younger women. And I hope that everyone listening has those pictures of, of women. Like every time I see white hair on my head, I am, I love it because both of my grandmas have beautiful, beautiful white hair. And I'm, I'm like, I'm 10% there. I'm headed there. Yeah. <laughs> 
So uh, thank you so much for coming on and just sharing some of your wisdom and your heart and your encouragement to us. Um, tell us more about your mom's, her her show and the stuff that she's done, because I'm guessing there's a lot of listeners who would be interested in stuff like that. I think if you are, I mean, honestly, anybody over 40, because she did, huh? she's done several episodes with women as young as, as in their 40s. I did several panels with her. Hmm. Um, but they do a lot of stuff for like people who are in their 50s, 60s and 70s. And and the goal is to try to inspire this kind of desire to like cross the finish line as as well as you can. I, I yeah. think that there's a lot of stuff in content production now in the larger world about like helping yourself to feel your feelings and do all that stuff. But then there's mm -hmm. this need for like, but we need people to inspire us to shoot for this place and to yeah. be, you know, to kind of go deeper into our faith. And so she's written a couple of books. Um, the women finishing well is where I would start. She did a hey. Mary principle book as well, but, um, but I would start with women finishing well, and you can listen to the podcast. Like they do, um, their their podcast should still be available to listen to. I think they still have a Facebook page. She's doing um, prison ministry now. Wow. So like she's she's actively where they live. She's inside mm -hmm. like doing prison ministry. And That's cool. So they're not recording the podcast anymore. They both kind of had a shift into other yeah. things, but you can still listen to the episodes. And it's the podcast women you, finishing well. What's the women name finishing of well? Okay. And uh, and just in general. If you are not a podcast, like you don't want another podcast to listen uh -huh. to, what I would do is I would look for the purpose, right? Like look for the thing that you're looking forward to. And because that's kind of what she focuses on. She's a high focus in the Clifton Strengths, right? Uh -huh. High significance, high focus. And so she's very much about let's find the goal that we're headed towards and then make that goal happen and head all the way towards it and finish all the way through yeah. the finish line. And, and her goal really is like, when I die, I want to still be doing the thing that I'm here to do to a point where I sort of die doing that thing. Like I die uh -huh. going through the finish line. And, yeah. and I think that's kind of the goal is to just get as much out of the life as possible. So yeah, women finishing yeah. well, her name is Chris, Chris Syme. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Becca. And uh, thanks to everybody for listening and happy aging to us all. <laughs>